Hello there and welcome to week four, part three, which is the last video of this course. Uh, if you've stuck it through all this way, congratulations and thank you so much for watching these videos. In this one, we are going to um, talk about networks. So in this last video, we are going to talk uh, about um, everything from how networks connect to um, the different types of networks that exist. We're going to talk about how um, data travels across a network, the protocols and guidelines um, that are set to um, that decide how that data gets uh, sent across a network. And we're going to connect it all to um, how it works with your browser, with URLs, the stuff you type in uh, when you want to go to a website, and DNS, the um, way that uh, we make sure that the computers understand where we want to go. So um, why this is all and very important is because very, very soon you're going to uh, get introduced to terms like HTTP or um, uh, routing or um, um, other terms, uh, uh, URL, um, DNS, that um, are going to be help for, helpful to you to understand how um, the stuff you code gets sent uh, across uh, the network. And if something goes wrong and you get a message uh, that says that couldn't connect to DNS server or something, um, then you might know a little bit about what's happening. Uh, or you can say what's the difference between HTTP or HTTPS and um, understand why you need to use one, not the other. Um, and you're also going to get introduced to some other types of uh, protocols that we're going to discuss. And then when you um, get in, in contact with uh, SSH, um, which you will, I think, pretty much as soon as you start, you'll have an idea of what that is. So without any further ado, let's get into the last video uh, about networks. So let's start with the concept of a network. What is a network? A network is uh, a bunch of devices that are connected together so that they can share resources and transfer information between each other. Now we have local area networks, which are, for example, um, your house. All the devices there are connected to each other in a local area network. We also have um, the internet, which is the biggest network of all. Um, it is a network that connects all of these smaller networks together, a network of networks, so to speak. The internet uses this complex systems of routers and servers that are interconnected to send data from um, its origin to its destination. Um, that's why we have a router at home and that is part of all of that entire system of networks. Um, and this is what allows uh, us to share information online, connect online, um, and um, this is what a little bit about what we're going to go through. And the computer itself is a very important part of a network. When networks communicate with each other, they need to connect to the, the router, the medium that's going to transfer on the information that is going to be sent. So we have a few different ways that you, we can connect our devices to the router that's going to then send on the information. We have something called a wired connection, which is using an ethernet cable and you plug that into the comp your computer and you plug it into the router and the data then travels through the wire to the router and then gets sent on off into the, off into the internet and continues on. And then we have Wi-Fi, 
which is a wireless uh, connection. So you don't need a wire to um, send information from your computer to the router and then further on. Uh, instead, it has an antenna that sends uh, radio waves to your router. It then picks that up and sends it on further along. The advantages of an ethernet cable or, or a wired connection is that um, it's a lot faster and there are fewer delays. Um, if you are uh, streaming a game or a movie and you want that to be very uh, smooth and without any hiccups and with no uh, loss in quality or, or in um, latency, you don't want it to buffer and you don't want to wait for that information then a wired connection is uh, the way to go. It's going to be a lot more reliable, faster, and allow for more data at once to come through. And a, a wireless connection, uh, Wi-Fi, is of course very convenient. No wire is necessary and um, you can work from anywhere and still be connected to your router and then to the rest of the internet. The issue with uh, Wi-Fi is that since it's a radio signal, it can be disrupted by anything that can disrupt a radio signal. Um, walls, uh, other electronics um, can disrupt the signal and create issues in transmission and um, be uh, a hindrance in uh, getting your information or sending your information in a reliable, stable way. So. When we talk about Wi-Fi, uh, using radio signals to send information, how does that exactly work? Well, there's a device in your computer that uh, remakes the data that you want to send into binary, ones and zeros. Um, once that's done, there is an antenna, if you're using Wi-Fi, that is going to transmit radio waves. So these ones and zeros the values uh, of that, the sequences of that, get encoded into the properties of the actual radio signal. So for example, if you have um, a snippet of binary code that's 1011, uh, that might, uh, those values might be um, how you change the frequency of the radio signal. Or if you have another bit of information, um, that is 01001, that those values are then uh, the values that change the um, strength of the radio signal. So we take the binary values and we uh, use those to modify the radio signal itself. So then that radio signal with these modified characteristics um, from, the, from the data we want to send gets sent um, as a radio signal to the router. The router receives that radio signal and it um, tracks and records those values from um, the different characteristics of the radio signal. And then it, from those values, uh, turn it in, turn, um, get back the binary uh, code itself. So it works this way that you have the code you use this code to change the signal, the signal sends, and then whatever the values here are, that's what the router gets as information. And then it uh, uh, turns into uh, digital data again, and it gets sent off, off uh, on into the rest of the internet. My uh, cat refused to not cuddle, so please welcome a special guest. Uh, of Hexi, my cat. Uh, try to ignore the purring. Um, so then we're going to talk a few, a little bit about different types of networks. So I've already mentioned the local area network, and you might recognize this because that's a lawn. Um, that is uh, when a network is localized, and there are a bunch of devices connected to each other in a very local area. You also have something called a WAN, which is a wide area network. So that is uh, just a bigger geographical area and it links a bunch of LANs together. 
because the likelihood is quite large that you're going to get into contact with the word switch, I would like you to just know what it is. So a switch is a device that um, directs traffic between different devices in the same lawn. Now, beforehand, um, these might have been separate devices, but most modern routers come with the switch built in. So it both, both has the capability to um, direct traffic within a lawn in between those devices, as well as uh, send data on towards the, um, the internet and the, the biggest network of them all. Um, sometimes when you program, you might come in contact with these things when there are error messages and knowing what a switch is and a router is and their jobs can be useful to troubleshoot and to just have an understanding of how it works. And even the fact that you need something to direct traffic uh, between devices in a lawn is good to know that it works on that level that um, you need something uh, like a switch to tell data where to go to route the data where it's supposed to go. Another type of network is a personal area network or as we commonly know it as uh, Bluetooth. Um, so that is also another type of network uh, that people might not be aware of. So there are different types and they work in a little bit different ways but what they all have in common is that they connect devices together. But we need something to um, direct data away out into the internet and tell the data where it needs to go. And that is where your router comes in. So you have a, a Wi-Fi connection and you want to go online. When you type in a URL and you um, that gets transmitted as a radio wave to your router, um, your router is what uh, directs the traffic where it needs to go out into the internet. So how can it really do that? Well, routers come with uh, databases, um, with tables um, that have routes or um, paths that data should go. So depending on the destination, it has these tables that are designed in a way to find the quickest and most convenient way uh, to your destination. So routers come with that and that is how they can then direct uh, the flow. They have a map built into them in the form of a database. So these maps, these, these, this information about um, possible ways to send data are called network paths. And each router then um, on the table when it knows, when it has that network path, uh, sends it along to the next destination along the path, the next router actually. Then that router sends the information along to the next router. And it can do that because when you send, um, when you want to access a website, the route the tables uh, they look they look up the ip address and then depending on the ip address and depending on the quickest network path in their routing table send it to the next router along that path so the data then really jumps from router to router server to server until it arrives where you want to go um, and this process of um, looking at the ip address looking up what's the most the fastest can most convenient way to get to your destination um, and then sending it along the part where you send it along to the next router is then the next hop so each router sends it along to the next hop on the way to the destination where it's supposed to go and so that nothing goes wrong here and that you don't have a network path that isn't available anymore, um, these, net these routers um, communicate with each other and have protocols to continuously update available network paths so that the next hop continuously is, um, uh, is uh, still in use and still available. 
Uh, network paths aren't always linear. The only uh, metric that they um, evaluate when choosing the next hop isn't just what's closest. It has to do with bandwidth, it has to do with a lot of things really that routers um, make decision, um, th the routers uh, take into consideration when they make a decision on what should be the next hop along the way to the destination. And sometimes that means that the network paths aren't linear and they don't just go in one straight line. So when data is supposed to be sent across a network, uh, a lot of the time, all of the time, uh, the information is too big to be sent as one big chunk. So what we do then is we uh, divide the data that's supposed to be sent into something called data packs or data packets. Um, and these data packets, they um, divide what you're going to send and each little packet gets its own um, sequential number so that you divide it, you send it across the network, and then when it arrives at a destination, that it gets put together in the correct order. So then when we say the data travels from your computer to the router and then to the rest of the internet, it data packets is the format in which it gets sent. The information first gets broken down uh, into bits, and then uh, so that it's not too large and doesn't overwhelm uh, the network or a network. And each packet has information in it besides just the information that's going to be sent. So you have the destination IP address and you have the origin and you have the size of the, um, of the data packet itself. And having this allows the network to know when to send what depending on bandwidth and and things like that and also it has the sequential number if you divide a packet into six pieces it's going to have information about this is piece number four for example so that when it arrives at a destination the uh, the data can be put together in the right order so networks are even so smart that they can send these um, packets even through different network paths, depending on what's most efficient for that, net for that packet and in that moment. Um, and they might not arrive in the same order as they were sent even. And this is why we need the sequential numbers so that we can put them together. So when it arrives at, it, at its destination, it gets put uh, together into the, into the correct order. And once that's done, then it gets presented to, uh, to whoever requested it. In your own local area, each device is going to have its own IP address that it uses to talk with the, uh, to the other devices in your, your local area. But then when you have the router as the sort of gateway between the internet and your own local area, all of these devices together get one single IP address. So they have their own when they're talking to each other, but then when something from the internet wants to talk to uh, any device in, in your local area, it references your public IP address. So you can think of this as an an umbrella IP address for all of your devices uh, because that's how um, devices from outside are, is going to, uh, is going to um, address uh, your device. So you have the router here, you have your devices here. When they talk, they have their own private IP addresses. But then if uh, something from a network wants to talk to this specific um, device over here, it's going to ask, uh, it's going to go through the public IP. But if uh, another um, uh, network wants to talk with the uh, device down here, it's still going to reference the same uh, public IP address. And then the router is the intermediary between the network from the outside and your local area network and all devices within there. So these private uh, IP addresses, they're not accessible to anyone outside of your local area. 
they're not routable um, via routers on the internet. So I've mentioned IP address a lot now, so let's go through what that is. Um, an IP address is basically the name of your computer, the location and name. Um, my computer has an IP address, you, your computer has an IP address, um, and whenever you want to talk to another computer, whenever one device on a network wants to talk on, with another device on another network, they do that by referencing the IP address. Um, so even when you type in a URL, say that you type in www.google.com, that is also going to have an IP address, that website. IP addresses are unique. Now they have to be, because if you want to talk to a website or another device on another network, uh, you can't have two uh, networks or two devices sharing the same address, of course. So they need to be um, individual and uh, unique to that. They need to be unique across all of the internet. So since um, private IP addresses aren't routable through the internet, how does this communication happen? And how does it get converted into a public IP address? Well, routers use something called NAT, which stands for Network Address Translation. So it takes your private uh, IP addresses and converts them into a public one. Then that public IP address is then provided uh, by your internet service provider. Um, so NAT is how the private IPs get converted into a public IP address. And the reason we have this uh, public, private and um, NAT and routers converting this is um, for one reason, just to preserve IP addresses. So if uh, IP addresses need to be unique so that you can navigate to it and route to it. Imagine if every single device had a unique identifier. By having a local area um, that have private, but then um, a gateway with a public, we conserve IP addresses. And then the router can do the job of when data comes in to your local area, uh, and wants to go to a specific device, the router then can take care of the routing to that specific device um, instead of us having way, way, way too many and too long IP addresses. So we need to conserve the IP addresses. We've discussed so far how um, data gets uh, divided, how it gets sent from your device to your router, how it moves along uh, from one router to the other using the next hop, such a funny way of explaining it, or the expression itself. Um, and we've discussed uh, addresses and how they can be public or private and how that works. So there's also the matter of the guidelines and protocols of how data gets transmitted across uh, networks. So these protocols are guidelines and rules for how data should be um, sent um, and uh, how it should be transmitted and received on the other end. Um, setting up rules for how that communication is going to look like. So when sending data across a network, the protocols that are responsible for that are, are called the TCP IP protocol the transmission control protocol. So what that does, that is the protocol that decides how your data gets uh, segmented into these packets. Uh, it makes sure to uh, open up a connection and that there is a connection between the sender and the receiver of the information, the data. And it makes sure that it arrives uh, without any errors and that it gets um, put together in the correct order uh, when it reaches its destination. So the most important thing here to remember is uh, the TCP handshake. So the 
Uh, TCP protocol is the protocol that is responsible for making sure that there is a, a clear, open and um, available connection between the sender and the receiver. So the client sends a message to the server and the server responds and then another uh, message is sent from the client to the server saying that, yep, I got your response, we're good to go. So it's a three-way message back and forth and that is the TCP handshake. And what this does is make sure that uh, both sides, both the sender and the receiver, the client and the server, um, have open communication lines and that there are no errors in the transmission process. Now the IP part of the TCP IP protocol stands for internet protocol. And this is the protocol that is responsible for actually routing and directing the, the data flow and the traffic over the networks. And it does that by uh, attaching a um, IP address to each packet that's going to be sent along the network so that uh, the routing also uh, knows where to send it along. The next protocol that you need to be aware of is the HTTP, HTTPS protocols. Okay. Um, and it's also important to understand that the TCP and IP protocol, they're the base level, they're the foundation of all the other protocols. Though they are uh, responsible for opening up a line of communication and for addressing and sending the packets of data along. But the HTTP, HTTPS uh, protocols, they're responsible for how the data is going to look, how it's going to be retrieved, uh, how it's going to be formatted. These protocols are also responsible for how it's going to be sent across a network and then how the response is going to look and even what format it should be, such as HTML or, or even JSON. So if HTTP was an old standard that used to be uh, the, mo the common one or the most common one, today we use HTTPS. Now the S at the end uh, stands for secure. What this means is that um, there's an added layer of encryption to the data, data that's being sent um, so that when data is being sent, it isn't... Um, it's not possible to uh, listen in and, or tamper with it. Now there are tons of other protocols as well. So for example, one that you might come in contact with is called WebSocket. And that uh, also works on top of the TCP IP protocol. But what it does this, instead of sending a, um, me a, a request and response continuously, it opens up a long uh, communication. Um, so if you would think about this, think about a chat. Um, you uh, make sure that there's a connection and then there's the HTTP that, that asks, hey, can we, can we talk using WebSockets instead? And then you upgrade your HTTP, HTTPS uh, to a WebSocket. So we go from that format, the HTTP to HTTPS, and then we say, no, actually, you know what? Let's do a WebSocket instead. And then instead of sending and receiving back and forth, you're going to have this long communication channel open. And this is great for specifically real-time responses and requests. And that's why I mentioned the chat, because when, you, uh, use, when you're using a chat, you want to get the response as soon as it's sent and you want to be able to reply in real time. And by using WebSockets, that's possible. Another protocol you're gonna be coming in contact with very soon is the SSH protocol or Secure Shell. So what that allows you to do is to establish connection with another device, um, like another computer. And then from your computer, you can use that computer as if you were sitting in front of it. You have access to that file, to those files. You have access to um, and can uh, use that computer as if you were sitting right in front of it and um, you're in control of it. Now, 
the secure part of the secure shell uh, makes sure that this connection that and working um, having access to a remote computer is encrypted and uh, secure so that nobody can come in and tamper or listen in what you're doing. Um, it's a tool that you use a lot to uh, work with servers um, and that's my cat again. She's doing something on my desk. Uh, when you work with server and servers and server code, you can use SSH to enter your servers, your, your computer um, and do things on that server using SSH from your own computer. So it is a useful tool to for um, backend and uh, server code. So we've arrived at browsers then. Um, browsers use the HTTP, HTTPS uh, protocol to establish a connection between a client and a server. So by having this connection, they communicate with each other. When, you, when you're using a browser, you uh, tend to go into your search bar or where you type in your, your address and type in a URL. That is, um, for example, www.google.com. That is the URL. But that is not um, how data is, that is not how the addressing to route data looks like. The URL is for humans to remember and type in and to understand. And machines don't understand this. The computers don't understand Google. Um, instead, this URL needs to be converted into a IP address. Entering a URL into your address bar or your where you type in your address, it's um, f asking the for a resource on that ad that exists on that address now when you type it in it contains um it has a few parts uh, you type in the protocol so http or https and if you don't type it in um, it gets filled in via the web browser so even if you might type in www dot when you actually look at the address, when you click on it, you will see the protocol most of the time as well. She just couldn't stay away. Um, the next part of the URL is going to be the domain domain name. So that is www.google.com, for example. That is the domain name. And the domain name um, identifies the server that you are asking your resource from. And after that comes a slash, and after the slash um, is the specific resource on that server that you are requesting. So let's say you uh, want to go to a specific product on Amazon.com. Um, you would have the domain name, which is the Amazon.com part, um, and then slash, and perhaps there would be a product ID after that. So. The domain name is the server, and after that, you ask you're asking for the for the page for that specific product, that specific resource contained on the server. Nowadays, we can also uh, pass something called a query to a server, so then we can ask the server specific information or specific questions by formulating our URL in a specific way. Basically, just like when we uh, write a function, we can have parameters in our um, function declaration. When we use queries, we can have parameters that we send along to the server. So for example, we can ask for all the laptops uh, or we can ask the server to, when it sends back it responds, sort it according to a certain way that we ask it to do. So you can ask the server to do things by sending along a query string and parameters in that query string. Now this is a bit of a um, um, extra step that you don't need to learn yet, um, but if you see the Q equals something something or sort etc. Uh, when you, you are using the internet, 
now you know that those are parameters that you can um, use to ask the the server specific for specific information and how that information should be presented. And now as a grand finale, we are going to conclude with talking about DNS. So DNS stands for Domain Name System. Um, before we've both talked about URLs, when you type in uh, an address and you want to uh, communicate with a server, but we've also talked about how resources uh, um, have IP addresses that you use to um, ask a server or to find a server. So what's the deal with having two different ways of identifying a resource or a destination on uh, the network or on the internet? Well, the thing is that the URLs, they're for our benefit, the humans, so that we can remember and type in um, uh, addresses on the internet. Uh, it would be quite difficult to remember uh, several IP addresses uh, and reach them that way. So if we have URLs that are for our benefit, we need a way to convert these URLs that are human readable and rememberable um, into IP addresses. And that's where the domain name system comes in. It takes the URL that you and I remember and converts it into the IP address. How this works essentially is that there are servers that have um, tables where a URL is correspondent to an IP address. So before any data gets sent anywhere, you uh, send a query, uh, a request to a DNS server, and you ask, ask it, hey, this URL, can you please send me back the IP address for this? Once you receive the IP address, that's when you can send data further along. Um, sometimes this, uh, if it's a website that you go to or a server that you ask for information, uh, often this um, IP address could be saved in your cache so that you don't actually need to send a request all the way to a DNS server. So usually when you type in a URL, First, you check if you have that uh, IP address, that conversion stored in your cache. And only if it sees that it doesn't, that's when it sends along a uh, request to a DNS server. And just how routers have tables and how they communicate with each other to make sure that paths are up to date and still usable, DNS uh, servers also communicate with each other. And if one DNS server doesn't have the conversion for the specific URL you are, want to convert into an IP address, uh, it's going to continue and ask another server until one of the servers that gets asked can convert it into an IP address. And then it gets sent along back to you uh, you get the IP address and from there on you, it's possible for you to send a request to the server using the IP address itself and not the URL. So all of the concepts that we've talked about today and really in this entire course uh, have been very broad and general and to give you an overview and an idea. Uh, sometimes educators tend to um, be passionate about their subjects and want to give you all the detail at once. And it's very easy to get lost in the details along the way. You sort of narrow your focus and become very, uh, very, you, you focus on one small part and then you zoom in on the next part and the next part and you kind of fail to see the whole instead, the whole picture, the whole how things are connected. Um, and sometimes you might, when you do that, you see this part and this part and this part and you understand them individually, but you don't really understand how they connect back to each other and you don't get an overview. You don't get a sense of understanding for the context. So all of the um, concepts and ideas that we've discussed in this course, of course, have a lot more depth to them if you go into more information. And you might need to, depending on what you're interested in and what you want to do later. I think even in, in the provided reading material, a lot of the stuff that I've talked about 
um, goes into deeper detail. Um, but by hearing these broad and general concepts and ideas, you get to you get to have a context and you get to see the whole picture and how they how things relate to each other. Um, and by putting it in these general terms and having an understanding for the uh, and a concept of how things um, uh, look from a distance, so to speak, then when you zoom in, you still have that context in mind. As a special treat for finishing this course, you'll get to watch my cat being snuggled. <laughs> So by having this uh, overview of how things work and um, this uh, quick one-liner and understanding of how things are, um, when you zoom into the details then, you still know what the bigger picture looks like. You might have a more under better understanding and you might uh, be able to go into detail, but you won't get lost in the detail in the same way you might if you go and look at each individu individual piece um, step by step. Um, and I feel like this happens a lot, and especially in the world of programming and computer science, where people want to give you all of the information at once, and they want to give every single piece of relevant, relevant information at once. Um, not understanding that if you do that, you might lose the most important bigger picture. Um, there's lots of things that you can talk about, for example, how a computer saves something to memory. But what you need to know right now is that there is a memory and that when you create a variable, uh, it saves uh, the computer saves that variable to its memory. And when you reference that variable, you retrieve the value um, of that variable. Uh, the computer goes to where that, uh, that variable is stored and gives you the value that has been stored in that memory cell. Now you could go into so much more detail about that, but what you need to know is that there's memory and you save it and you can retrieve it. Um, and no matter how many details you learn about that, um, the bigger picture is what's important here. Um, and if you go into information overload about how this memory is saved and what processes go into it and so on and so forth, then it's difficult. It's easy to get lost in in that. So hopefully this this uh, course gave you not a detailed look into programming and computer science and and sort of an introduction to all of that, but an over overview, a broad overview, so that when you come in contact with these terms, they're not completely unfamiliar, and you can place them uh, in context with each other. You'll know that a URL in DNS has to do with networking. You'll know that a variable is something you use when you code. You know that a terminal is a, is a, is a UI that you use to communicate with the computer uh, using text commands. You'll know that um, uh, a function is a repeatable set of instructions. You'll kind of know these things and you know how they relate to each other. You'll know that a virtual machine is a, a faked computer inside of your computer and so on and so forth. So that is my hope that after this course you will have a lay of the land. Um, words that you might hear and come in contact with are a little bit illuminated without getting bogged too, down too much by detail and that you can see how these concepts that we've talked about relate to each other and um, how they're connected to each other, how they influence each other. So um, I'd like to say thank you if you managed to watch all of these videos. Good job! <laughs> um, and thank you for um, taking the time to um, read and take this course and listen to me ramble on about computers and programming. Uh, and I wish you luck um, and I hope that you are going to enjoy coding and programming and the world of computer science. And I wish, I hope for you that um, you remember um, the, we the lesson about mentality and how important it is for you to allow yourself to make mistakes 
and grow and trust that even though you might not understand everything right now, you trust in yourself and you trust in the process and that if you just keep at it, that you will understand one day, one day soon. So uh, once again, thank you and good luck and uh, have fun. <laughs>